Welcome to another episode of the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mhenna. Today on the series, I'm pleased to have Daisy Jagaron on the series, who is an award-winning award filmmaker, journalist, and entrepreneur. She's worked as a journalist with countless organizations all over the world and is the director behind the film Enough, Lebanon's Darkest Hour. Daisy, welcome to Afikra. How are you, Mikey? Thank you very okay. much for uh, having me on your show. I'm doing well. You know, not many people start off by saying how are you it's very sweet of you <laughs> oh well i think uh i think we should i think yeah you know, it's a you know it's not a compliment it's it's a, a necess necessity really to be as thoughtful um yeah. to you and the the people you talk to yeah so you know how are you, how are you Mike? i'm doing really well <laughs> um much better now i have to say so let me let me start by um sort of addressing the first thing um, that I think a lot of people uh, think uh, in Lebanon and sort of in the Arab world when they first meet you, which is you have this like last name that's very Lebanese and Arab, Jadon, um, but your accent in English suggests that you didn't grow up in the region um, and you grew up in Australia. So I would just want to ask you, do you feel like that that gives you some sort of like superpower um, and that perspective sort of enables you to ask interesting questions and um, sort of interrogate what's going on here in a way that somebody who is born and raised in Lebanon, or at least born and raised in the Arab world, um, might not be able to? What a great question. Um, my only superpower comes from what God blessed me with. And um, he, from a very young age, I was blessed with reading and loving stories and being able to write. Um, what I think um, the advantage I have, having grown up outside Lebanon, I was five when we left Lebanon, um, is that I, you know, you know, they talk about bird's eye view. I can do that more easily than those in the middle of the mess, you know, and, and, you know, you see the wood for the trees. And I think that is, a, if you want to call it a superpower, it's not, it's just a training. It's a way of being able to pull yourself out to be able to see what's really going on more clearly because when anyone, and, you know, it happens to me all the time when I'm in the midst of something, I can't see the wood for the trees and I can't think clearly to make the right decisions and strategically, where do I want to go? And so that really helped me looking at Lebanon from abroad, um, trying to get my head around it. I couldn't quite get my head around it until I started coming back again. I mean, I come back all the time, uh, but I'd come for two weeks or four weeks or something, and it wasn't really interrogating what was going on. It was enjoying the incredible beauty of Lebanon, the people, the food, life, and that. So that's the advantage I have as a diaspora, um, ex-diaspora now because I live in Lebanon. Yeah. Um, but I still have that. I take. I hold very firmly to that perspective. Otherwise, I'll get caught up in the melee that's going on in Lebanon and I won't be able to serve Lebanon if I get stuck in it. Yeah. Um, and that's a training too as a journalist. Uh, you know, you have to be able to really find the story. What is the story? So I was reading your bio and it said something that caught my eye. It said, um, after several years in sport, Daisy moved to the international desk to cover foreign affairs. And, I, and it struck me, what about the reporting process in the world of athletics? Do you feel like actually like lends itself to the sport of <laughs> politics? <laughs> well, no. I think journalism is journalism. Yeah. If you're a good journalist, there are rules and processes and you find the story. Uh, but I loved sport as a child. And yeah, me too. It was so easy to, I found it comfortable when I was doing my cadetship. Um, you do your training, you get to move into different departments, um, entertainment, sport, finance, news, crime, um, all of those areas. And I really loved it at sport and I wanted, and I was, 
um, very attracted to the sportsman, you know. <laughs> so much more attractive than Lebanese politicians, as it turns out. <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah, I I I, uh, I requested that I finish and and be positioned on the sports desk at the Australian newspaper and. Um, and I had sort of done, you know, three or six months on the desk and I got on really well with the sports editor and I uh, just found it really comfortable um, and I loved it. I I, I love sport. I, I think their sport is a wonderful um, leveler for everyone. doesn't matter. It's like, you know, it, this is what brings us together. doesn't matter what status you are, background, you love your team, you love the sport um, and being assigned after about six months or eight months on the sports desk, my own round, which is really unique, a sports round to own soccer. So I was assigned to be the first soccer writer on um, in Australia, first female soccer writer in Australia and first female sports writer on the, the Australian. So it was awesome um, and I loved it. I, I wasn't... Um, as well versed on soccer, football, as I was on cricket and rugby league and, you know, other sports, but I, it's sport and I knew, and I understood the game and I understood the rules and um, yeah, it was exciting, but yeah, lending it to moving to the international desk was a huge flip, a huge flip. Um, Yeah. um, But I did that after traveling to Lebanon for the first time as an adult um, when I was 23 my mother forced me to come here. I was traveling around Europe and I just finished the Olympic games in 1988 and I was very excited. And, um, and I was in Europe and mom said, come and see your relatives in Lebanon, you know, go and see them. And, and I said, but there's a war mum, you know, I could die, you know, (laughs) she said, it's fine. You know, you go to the village, it'll be fine. And, um, I reluctantly did it. I was coming for two weeks and ended up staying for six and, completely changed my world completely mm. did you grow up in a uh, primarily Lebanese community in Australia we're in Australia by the way let me let's get that right first Sydney in Sydney yeah and no we didn't grow up in a primarily Lebanese area at all I we had little to do with the Lebanese community we were very Lebanese family everything was culturally Lebanese and my mum and dad talked Lebanese at home um uh but we we didn't talk it so I developed an ear for it but I very bad you know tongue though I yeah I sound very foreign when I talk and people laugh at me but it's okay I, I enjoy it <laughs> but um yes we grew up it was just I don't know the dad didn't um found an opportunity to buy a shop in an area that had um mostly you know Anglo-Saxon or Greeks or Italians, not so many Lebanese. So we grew up with a mix of cultures and uh, later got involved. Um, After that trip to Lebanon, I got involved with the Lebanese and started to, in Australia, and started to dive into the whole, my whole roots and everything. Yeah. I mean, what did you, when did you start to actually think, you know what, this six weeks is it going to actually be? I'm going to I'm going to stretch this six weeks into like a whole career um, right. and into a life's work. Immediately, as soon as I got back to Australia after that six weeks, um, I wrote a two page spread for the Weekend Australian. So it's a broadsheet. So it was a long long story, um, and. I talked to my sports editor and my editor in chief, and I said, "You know, this is what's happened. This is calling. This is not a. I need to move to the foreign desk. I want to understand what's going on in the Middle East. I want to understand why Lebanon, you know, is you know going through this war. And I feel very pulled to this. And uh, they were great. They, you know, uh, within a few weeks, I moved on to the international desk and uh, was working with the foreign editor and you know, learning, reading, learning about all the whole world, not just Lebanon, but I got to, you know, we have to sift through stories every single day. So you, you can, you know, search, let me turn that off for you. Sorry about that. Um, You have to search and read everything that's going on around the world. And it's, um, and then, you know, understanding, I got more in depth in the, um, in the whole issue. Yeah. 
You feel at your core, like if you think about your work, it's interesting that that conversation you're having in 1988 with your editor saying, I need to understand, right? Like yeah. I need, not you editor needs to understand, not even the reader needs to understand. Mm. I precisely need to understand why, where does that need come from? And do you find, do you finally understand? <laughs> because if you do, <laughs> please explain to me. <laughs> Uh, actually, you know, everyone says Lebanon is very complex yeah. and it's, um, and it's, you know, it's a, you know, I would say some profanity here, but it's, <laughs> um, you know, it's a head, you know, whatever. It, yeah. Feel free. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a mind fuck. Yeah. There you uh, go. <laughs> um, it's, it is when you don't take the time to do the research and d- dive into the background and um, really delve into how everything, it doesn't just happen by chance. There is nothing that happens by chance. It's a series of decisions and actions and action and uh, events. And each time someone's making another de- decision and Lebanon was another bad decision, not only internally, but regionally and globally, you know, there was a lot of foreign interference and we can't blame them. And I had this conversation with, you know, the editor, um, Middle East editor at The Economist when I was doing the research on the film, you know, why is so much, so much interest in Lebanon? Why has everyone's got, everyone's got their fingers in Lebanon's pie and um, why are they disrupting Lebanon? And, and he really helped me again, understand this very simply he said, look, you know, um, and it was a time, you know, with Lebanon, we knew there was oil and gas off the coast and they're now, they're now trying to steal the gas and oil. And and he said, look, you know, um, look at other countries in the Middle East, in the region and around the world. They're smaller than Lebanon. Look at Qatar, look at Bahrain, look at, you know, UAE, look at those countries. They have oil. They have much more oil than Lebanon. And, yes, there's, you know, some involvement uh, with foreign countries, but the difference with them and Lebanon is that they have a very strong government. They have a strong, um, you know, adherence to their patriotism and sovereignty. Lebanon's leaders from independence were always externalising their contacts and they have continue to do that, you know, and the different sectarian groups are making alliances with external, you know, regional partners and global partners. So they're inviting foreign interference. Now, if Lebanon had a strong government and there was, uh, you know, clarity and purpose, those countries would still work with Lebanon but on a different basis. And, you know, he ex- explained that even more. And I was like, I, I really, it really shifted. And this is, you know, talking about learning about Lebanon, you know, um, it's an ongoing process. But this is where continuing to be curious, continuing to know there's a solution um, to a problem. Um, and going back to what I said about being a complex country and a co- with complex issues, when you break it down, it, really isn't that complex. It's just that uh, we like to, the narrative that people deliver make it complex and the the things they say, the propaganda. But it really is very simple and no different to any other country. The people of this country, the real, you know, everyone, every sect, want to have the same kind of opportunities and stability and security and um, enjoy life and however uh, and I've had this argument just recently they they um, haven't really been active in protecting that that um, this beautiful country this incredible culture that is unique in the world and I think we took it for granted for a long time and, you know, we're paying the price of the decisions, the good decisions we didn't make in the past and the right decisions we didn't make and the stepping up, 
and taking ownership um, and, you know, allowing others to, uh, you know, it's in the culture, you know, the we love each other very much. There's this real bond um, and kindness and acceptance and ma'alashi, mar'a or habibi and, you know, and there's a loyalty factor. And, again, it, it's part of our incredible mosaic of our, our culture and our fabric of our identity. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, accountability always should be part of decision making. And even with children, the way we bring up children, it's not just here. And, you know, I've got, you know, friends in Australia and around the world who don't parent their children. They want to be friends and they want to be accepted and they want to be liked, yeah. they want to be loved and, you know, but you have a responsibility also to to guide that child effectively um, and, you know, that's, part of the clarity that comes to me and it's an ongoing thing it's um it's not simple because I run a company I've got staff I've had up to 27 staff and it's horrible <laughs> trying to manage people you know and uh, but you've got to have those rules and boundaries and KPIs and job descriptions and come back to them and do the process the management process is critical and um, having the right people in those positions is absolutely vital to the success of any country, any company, any family. It's yeah. all the same, you know, starts at home. Yeah. Okay, I want to ask you a question. During, uh, after uh, August 4th, mm. which I was here for, um, there was this rally cry for months afterwards, don't stop talking about Lebanon. Yes. On, on social media, don't stop talking about Lebanon. And it's a it's a refrain that gets reused, you know, don't stop talking about Ukraine, don't stop talking about, yeah. like fill in the blank. Um, yeah. And my own cynicism kicks in and I say, you know what, actually, why should somebody in Milwaukee or somebody in like Cartagena mm -hmm. or somebody in Sydney or somebody in Japan or somebody in Berlin not mm -hmm. stop talking about Lebanon? They have their own problems. You know, we are a small little place on the map. Maybe they should stop talking about Lebanon. Mm. So let me ask you the question. Yeah. Why should this matter to anybody? Mm. It's a great question and a great perspective also because I was just talking to a journalist from London. Uh, he's based here and I'm, I'm talking to the media around the world to try and get them on the story. Um, and, you know, to your point, they're just not interested in Lebanon. Uh, yeah. it, they're over it, like the Middle East leaders are over it. Yeah. Um, it's a tiresome story. At that time, though, like we were talking about August 4, um, it was an important cry and it was such a huge injustice and the fear that it would just go the way of every other crisis and situation that it you know, befallen Lebanon. Um, but, you know, I was thinking about it today, talk, having, you know, trying to talk to this, you know, to the point of we need more mainstream global media talking about Lebanon, which would then make more global audience and diaspora talk about Lebanon and not forget Lebanon. And uh, it really confronted me this morning having that conversation with him um it's it's happened with a few people now like you know they're just not interested in Lebanon everyone's not interested in Lebanon they're not interested in Lebanon and to your point maybe they should they've stopped talking about Lebanon because we are not taking care of our own country we are not doing what is necessary we are not understanding um our role in our destiny. They're repeating the same story. It's like they were talking, you know, like we can't repeat, oh, the sit-in now and the whatever. It's like, we're, okay, we reported it but we every week. You know, it's escalated to another level. I'm trying to pitch that story to them to get them to report. But it's tiresome. It really, I get it. I really sadly get it. Um, 
And that's why I'm doing the reporting I'm doing, but I won't get tired with it. I know there's an audience that are interested. They're not the, the mass audience, but there is an audience and um, it's it's got to be different angles. But, you know, I, I, I'm i not, I'm with you there. There's, yeah. there's a, it's a dilemma. It really is a conundrum. You're like, we need to take it back, and this is what I'm doing here. I'm trying to take it back, and I'm trying to uh, be strategic. And my God, on these WhatsApp groups, there are so many groups, and the amount of chatter and distraction. And this, they're not stopping talking about Lebanon, but they're losing focus. And this is where you know, pulling back and having that bird's eye view, like I was talking about at the start, and being able to step back. Um, helps you find the story that might interest the world again and uh, because you can't just keep giving them noise because even when I was outside, oh, my God, the noise coming at 11 and I was like, you know, my dad's watching, you know, the TV stations and it's all the same thing and it's, uh, you know, yeah, that's, that's the problem with with it. But, you know, I remember that video, Kate Blanchett, Australian actress, um, mm-hmm. she Nadine Lubicki, I think, wrote the the script for that video that they made straight after the blast, and I loved it. And I was, I commend them, and commend Kate Blanchett for doing that generously, giving her her time um, without you know payment. It was just you know she felt the call and and did it for for the Lebanese. Everyone loves loves Lebanese everywhere yeah. in the world. We are loved and. But everyone freaking feels sorry for us, and I'm just sick and tired of that too. Like you know, I, I go to I went to France last year, went to Paris, went to the Cannes Film Festival, and go to Paris, and the Parisians are ah oh, Beirut, ah oh, you know the tears, yeah, of what it was and what it is, and so this is a point of where we've got to step up ourselves. They're waiting for us. They want to see us change. They want, and we had a bit of change last year with the election. We got some independent MPs and change MPs in and it began, but it's slow. But we need to drive forward. And I know the people are exhausted and they're being battered at every level. The, you know, the government is just hammering them with these economics difficulties, a crisis, the jobs, the salaries, inflation, the the lira, the food, the bread, the petrol, it's no end. There's no end to the calamities that they have to think about on a daily basis once they get up in the morning, you know. You know, it's I I understand the the desire to drive for change, obviously. Um, um, But I always... My general sense is even going back to October 2019 um, was that I felt like there was there wasn't I never felt like there was a um, a communal understanding that this is a marathon and not a sprint mm. and that we're undoing not a few years worth of damage. We're undoing multiple decades that go beyond uh, 1975. Mm. Um, And really like undoing the the structural problems that have to do with uh, Mm. the formation, the creation of the the entire Republic. Yeah. Um, And that the idea of that, like one election cycle, we're all of a sudden going to have an independent um, parliament seemed ludicrous. Absolutely. Um, when you speak to, you know, like uh, when you speak to MPs and um, and you you're in all these WhatsApp groups, um, do you feel like there is an understanding of the long game and that saying, guys, this is we're doing this for our grandkids. We're not doing this for next spring. Mm. Um, and this is going to take a long time. We're birthing. A, we're birthing a baby and this baby needs to turn for it to be an adult. It needs to go through. 20 years. I mean, this, it's going to take a lot of nurturing to get mm. there. Mm. Um, is there an understanding that this is a long game or is it just like, unless we get two years, get this in two years, <laughs> we're out. Uh, you know, I, um, 
I know that there is a desperation. They're desperate. They keep saying we can't last another four years, even to the next election, you know. So there's a desperation that there's some people at the lowest level of, you know, the the economy and, and um, social status are very much under extreme hardship. So they don't know how they're going to survive and they can't put up with it. But um, so they want, they're looking for some signs. Give us kaharaba at least. You, really, really what they ask for is, do you think we'll have kaharaba in the next six months? This is a few months after the yeah. election. They're, Absolutely not. There's just nothing. There's no discussion. There's no plan. There's, if you're going to have Kaharaba, it, it would have been you would have been hearing about it. But these people have no plan for the country. So yeah. please think about that. Um, to your question, um, you know there are obviously levels of, of groups in society and intelligence and externally and internally among the Lebanese that understand it's a it's a long game. Um, but the long game, again, isn't just going to happen by itself. And this is what I'm, you know, trying to say with a lot of people. I work, I'm working with diaspora groups and I'm working with people here on the ground and I'm, it doesn't happen by itself. You know, you don't have an idea and just because you have an idea and a dream, it's going to happen one day. This takes substantial amount of planning, consideration, testing, consistency, and, and never giving up. That's the only way we're going to get the Lebanon we deserve and want and real change. And you need to start planning. And you just look at countries in the past, historically, you know, America, Britain, you know, the, the revolutions across different countries, they endured, some of them, 100 years for real change, real change. Um, I'm not saying it's going to take that long and, and people are saying, oh, yeah, but we're Lebanese and this is a small country and we can do it. And, you know, like, you know you're know, you right. This took decades to build this fabric, this web of corruption, and it's deeply ingrained. And yeah. unfortunately people have become used to it because that's, they're surviving. It's not that the culture is we're all bad and, um, you know, they're all crooks and everything. They're doing what they can to survive, right? That's what they've been that's what who they what they have to be to survive. Uh, but what you know, what to that point, what gives me great hope and faith is, you know, they're good, good people at their nature. You know, when you do these um, uh, psychometric studies, when you're trying to employ people, yeah. and you have you do strength this, finders and. And you you you, you want to know what their character is like under pressure and what their normal normal modus operandi is. And our normal modus operandi, our normal state is to be happy, have a lot of faith, trust each other, work hard most of the time. You know, we do like to enjoy life a lot, but but they still get stuff done, you know, they but they respect life and love life. And that's one of the best things about Lebanese culture. Um so that gives me, you know, when I think about it in that way, there, the, the, there is good basis, good foundations, but they've been like um, abused, ignored, allowed to um, atrophy because of the system. But if you, you go back to the hustle, as they say, uh, there's a lot of good opportunity and possibility and potential, but potential. You know, as we all know, with sports, sports, they're great sports stars, but if they're lazy and don't do the work, they don't get the gold medals. They don't win the yeah. um so we need to do that. So um um so the marathon is so important to really get into the narrative and the vernacular and and but what I think feel is still missing is a vision. There's no vision. So there's nothing people can rally behind. And there's no one person or group of people. And we thought the change group would bring it together. That Like they're standing for change and I respect them all and they are the ones really, um, really standing against um, the old system. Um, but there's no vision. You need a vision like a company. 
vision, mission, purpose, you know, this stuff, you need to have it. And this is, you know, where I, this is my work. This is, you know, like, you know, I gave him a vision in the film and in, in us, you know, my vision is, you know, for us to have a free and fair Lebanon, elect people who, you know, will give us, will represent those values and stuff. But then you've got to extrapolate and define it and make it meaty and real. What does that mean? Yeah. And this is a missing piece right now, but there's a lot of people with a lot of willingness to work on it. And I'm working with the diaspora, a lot of groups in the diaspora, a lot of people in the diaspora, and we get it. We get that we need to come in, come in, Yanni, as well, get together, and we need to unite and we need to have a vision and a plan and a roadmap of how we're going to help our you know, um, brothers and sisters in Lebanon. And now that I'm here, I can give a lot more tangible, um, you know, information and, and validation and ideas. And um, so we are thinking long-term, you know, and, but we need, we need 2026 is really critical, Mikey. It's really critical. That's yeah. Another big shift happens, a much bigger shift than 2022 because um, we need to, to, you know, have a bit of a leap and then another leap, you know, and that's what's important. Um, and, you know, I, I always quote Martin Luther King Jr., you know, and he's, you know, he said that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Yeah. And people just cut the, usually cut that, quote off there, but I like to finish it. And it says, as long as we re remain steadfast to its completion. Yeah. And that's the, that's the thing. If you don't remain, if you are sitting in this hope, oh, yeah, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice and eventually we'll get justice. No, he didn't say that. just that. He said, as long as you remain steadfast to its completion, you got to finish the job. We're not, we've got to finish the job and we've got to do it right. Yeah. And it's an arc. It's not a turn. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. not a shift. It's not a pick. It's yeah. an arc. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about the role that the diaspora plays because there's this, there's this idea, right? So for people who are listening to this um, podcast who are not Lebanese and don't have a deep familiarity with the, the state of the diaspora, um, there are many estimates of the number of people who describe themselves as being Lebanese sure. abroad who, and it ranges from usually like nine to one to 12 to one of uh, folks who say that they're Lebanese in some uh, capacity and are living it from Brazil to Australia, from Africa to Europe, from Asia to uh, North America, all over the place. That's um, so, and there is this utopic vision among um people like me who are here who think, oh, the diaspora are going to come in on their horse and they themselves have all these progressive ideas um, and are perfect and they are <laughs> perfectly suited um, with all their familiarity with good governance that they themselves will come in and transform Lebanon into this Singaporic um, little small um bubble yeah or utopia mm. but what was interesting is that in 2022 there were all these videos of lebanese diaspora in places like germany or whatever who were standing firm <laughs> with their sectarian ties mm. um and it blew i mean it blew my mind um so since you're familiar with this Mm. somewhat familiar with this group obviously you don't know every single uh little diasporic bubble all over the world but mm. do you feel like this is a community that is has incentives aligned with the folks who are here on the ground who are fighting for change um or are there are you know are the problems that started here ported to different places like australia um, the problems definitely are imported in, in foreign countries, but um, I watched it all and I've been in contact with a lot of um, diaspora groups and I went to the diaspora for my film. I spoke to diaspora all over the world to try and understand their perspective because they're very, they play a critical role. If it wasn't for the diaspora, Lebanon would have been annihilated 
20 years ago, even, you know, they they contribute 40% to GDP of this country. You know, I think it's $8 billion a year it comes from the diaspora. Without the diaspora, we're gone, you know, see ya. But um, so the thing is, this is this art, this feeling, this connection, this, you know, um, responsibility and love for their family and the country. Um, but you, to your point about the numbers, um, yes, the numbers range significantly. And um, what I was looking at, because we were analysing it for the film and we were travelling um, with the film around the world to different festivals and uh, and learning more about the, the groups and where they are and the, you know, concentrations of Lebanese in different countries, you know, you, you do have pockets in, you know, most countries of the sectarian groups Um and they, because they are the ones, you know, it wasn't until 2019 we all were part of a party. It was only a few years ago we all belonged or believed in, well, I stopped a few years before that, but um, it, was, it wasn't that long ago that the awakening happened and, it, and the awakening, thank God, happened here and we we also, the, those parts of the communities, the diaspora communities woke up too. And they're not the majority but they're the most active. So they're, you talk about maybe a million um, Lebanese around the world who are actively involved in the Lebanese communities in, in any of those countries. It's not maximum, maximum. Now you talk about um, um, numbers of about, you know, anywhere from 12 to 16 million. Some people want to make it even higher around the world. And they're the people that, resonate or identify with being Lebanese. So they're the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Lebanese. Um, and they're the ones that my film really pulled in because it was in English and it was a story they could relate to and it, it really opened their eyes and it came in a, in a story that they could comprehend. They're the, they're the audience we need. They're the audience. They're the people that have had the distance, have grown up differently, but still have a connection. And they're the one, they're the mighty, you know, game changer. They're the silent, you know, sleeping giant. Um, so, you know, they are an audience that we need to continue to tap in and they've come on board and they've looked after August 4, they started looking for how do I get involved with the Lebanese community? How do I help Lebanon? So you had a lot more of an influx in interest and people involved in the the situation in Lebanon. Um, so we need to know how to communicate with that audience. And it's great that you've got this podcast because I'm sure you have probably picked up in the number of subscribers after the August 4 and revolution because that's when the spikes started to happen and people started to wake up. Um, this this massive group of people can't ride in on their white horses and save the country, uh, but they have a wealth of knowledge and experience, and you know, and and if if used effectively, really can support the change movement in Lebanon. But they need to get organised as to how, and they need to work together, not like this is the thing that was happening for me when I was travelling with the film and speaking to politicians around the world and which Lebanon do you represent? You know, when people come to us, it's, you know, the Maronites or the Orthodox or the Sunnis or the Shias or the Druze or the whatever. That's like, and then different organisation representing, I speak for the Lebanese community, like there's so many organisations and they're tired of that. They're tired of that too. Like the media's tired of Lebanon's story, the politicians and global leaders and humanitarians and all that, they're tired of that. Like they're just done. We need to grow up. We need to get professional. We need to get organised. We need to get together as an external diaspora under one umbrella. We don't have to, you know, lose our individual identities or like, you know, we're still who we are, but we need to speak with one voice. We need to have a collective, you know, narrative, a clear narrative, and we need to be... Um, consistent and and have a campaign, have a strategy, not, oh, this happened, let's go. Ooh, you know, we all just jump up and then 
dies down. There's no consideration for a campaign. We need to plan for what we want, the end game. We need to look at the end game. The end game, be part of a milestone in the end game is the 2026 elections, but that's not the end, you know. That's part of getting to where we really want, and that's where the vision comes in. Yeah. Um, And that's why you have, like, Saudi Arabia Vision 2030. You know, they've got a vision for 2030 in Saudi Arabia. Apparently, Gibran Basile announced a vision for Lebanon for 2050, and people are going, oh, my God, 2050, like, you know. Yeah. We can't survive. But so this, the Des- Des- board has an incredible role to play and need to be far more um, uh taken far more seriously. Now, I heard on the ground here from different people around since being here, you know, you know, the diaspora shouldn't be coming and telling us what to do. You know, they don't live here, they haven't, whatever. Uh, But, you know, on the flip side, they want the money of the diaspora, um, but they don't want any advice. Well, you know, hang on, we've let you go for 40 years and this is where we got to. You got us to here, but you still want our money, but you don't want to listen to our advice. Like, come on. Fill me a thousand times. I'm not going to be fooled anymore. We've got to really draw the line. This is the conditions. No, no different to the IMF. You know, all of them saying, "Hang on, guys, you've you've fooled us for a long time. We want real reforms. This is the plan. You don't want to comply. You're not getting our money." Uh, and I'm not saying the Lebanese diaspora should blackmail them because you still need to help them humanitarianly. But um, for political strategy, political campaigns, the next election, which started on, you know, 16th of May 2022, the campaign yeah. 2026 started, we need to be actively really moving much faster than we are in the diaspora to get organised and have our strategy. And we are, and there's a group of organisations and people that are working, but we need to move faster. So let me ask you about that, because as you're talking, you have all these. First of all, I feel like that's a good first draft of your campaign speech, just to, to put that <laughs> <laughs> to put that out there. But um, I keep they keep saying to me, you know, you should run. You should be an MP. I'm going, listen, no, I don't think you should be an MP. I'll tell you what I think you should be. OK, OK, I'll tell you what I think you should be. Not an MP. Um, there is no single organization that organizes diaspora the diaspora across nations right no there's no global organization um because most of these people when they left the vast maybe not vast majority but a huge minority um, of people who left what is now called lebanon left a place that was called syria once upon a time right um my great-grandparents on my mom's side left what is modern day lebanon went to the u.s and had syrian passports yeah when they were asked what they were at the time, they said Syrian. Mm. Um, and only later in the you know 60s, they're like, oh, I guess, I guess we're not, right? Mm. Um, so, and they these people went all over the world, right? So there is no institution, there is no single organization that that tries to create a constituency um of and sort of cobble together these million people that you're talking about who are super active and say okay wait what is our vision forget what is the vision that comes from the people who are running the organization because there is no there really isn't no us us versus them there is no diaspora versus non-diaspora every single person from the taxi driver to the to the mp themselves yeah are trying to become part of the diaspora. <laughs> <laughs> everyone right. is everyone is trying to become part of the diaspora, and most likely either they or their cousins or their brothers or sisters or children will become part of the diaspora. That is that is the truth of right. this place. That has never not been the, tr- the truth of this place, mm. right? That is our entire business model. That's always been our business model. So I wonder if there's some way to create a governing body for that huge group of people. And then almost, I would imagine that now that I'm thinking about it out loud, it's like that organization should have a development bank, basically the Lebanese diaspora development bank. Right. Um, and like this should be coordinated and there should be a clear number of core values. And that's what I think you should do. <laughs> Not an MP. 
<laughs> I um, hear you loud and clear. And yeah, my point to the, you know, my answer to them when they say that, so I, there's no value in me really. I mean, I can help a community, but I have far more, I can be far more effective if I'm for everyone and I want to be for all Lebanese and, um, and and this is the platform that I have is to speak for everyone and try and maintain that impartiality uh, as long as it, it, you know people are working ethically and um, and raise the voice or arguments for Lebanon internally and globally. And to your question about doing what you just said is you know you're a thousand percent right, and this is really the conversation that's been ha- we've been having from for a year and a half now to coordinate a governing body, not necessarily, um, you know, it, it's a convening. It's a, we, we're trying to work out a term. It's like a coalition, uh, a co- you know, uh, or body that brings in all of these. Um, diaspora groups and and perspectives and we are you know god willing the plan is to you know we've outlined what the objectives we have and the vision defining the vision we all need to come together in a workshop in about a month and a half um so you know it is happening and what is our vision You're not just my vision it's everyone's let's take those aspects of you know your your description of a vision um yeah. and your dream for this country and challenge it and defy and 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 shape it um and come together and do this together because this is what we want for Lebanon we want Lebanon to be whole not to be divided you know we can't just be for one sect or two sects it's for all and this is the beauty of Lebanon so you know I'm I'm definitely you know already working in that direction and trying to help again because I'm not part of a diaspora group um I come with some neutrality and I love and respect them all and I stand my position there because I am you know humbly asked a lot to join a group and I say look I love you and I love what you're doing but I can't you know I I should just stay for everyone because I don't you know I don't want others to think I'm against them and you, you know there are you know ties and you know this yeah. challenge competitive but that, this is our problem specifically this is our problem this is precisely <laughs> our problem because we don't have um it's you know there's this um everything is a party of one right it's not really though because you know these groups are made up of hundreds of people so they're working together but they've decided to do it their way you know and these people have decided to do it their way and they should maintain their individuality and there's a diversity and like australia actually is a wonderful you know um example of uh productive diversity and effective diversity and um you know, it, here it's all about your faith, your religion. There it's about ethnicity. So and religion doesn't, you know, play that that role that religion does here. Um, so, but, you know, you take, extrapolate or look at broader, it's a diversity of opinion and, and democracies are like that, you know, and you have look at America and the minorities and the... <laughs> And I look at charities, you know, it's not just about being Lebanese and we have this ego thing and we all want to be a leader and blah, blah, blah. It's human. It's a human characteristic. It really is. We all want to say it's Lebanese. It's a human human thing. Um, and, and so those people need to be dealt with cautiously or challenged. And so you don't elect the person who's got an ego. You don't bring that into your value system. You have a structure with doesn't allow egos it allows values to to control you and guide your mission yeah and this is the basis where you you start from and many more people will will come will be attracted to that because a lot of good people out there a lot of good people who want to work for lebanon and have sacrificed and volunteered and you know um and everyone deserves recognition um, it's in and and because they are working, but it's just this is why you know right now in the formative stages of trying to bring this global coalition together, we have to be very 
sensitive and 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 understanding. We have to really put ourselves in the other person's shoes and hear what they are saying, feel where they're coming from so we can attend to those fears. It's all fear. It's all fear. Nothing else. It really, ego is about fear, you know. Yeah. Ego is a, a significance, needing significance, you know. When you grow beyond that, when you evolve, I've done a lot of work on myself. Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll take the free therapy. Go, go for it. Uh, it was fascinating what she, understanding, you know, when they define it, you know, there are six stages in a human um, development. And the first yeah. one is, um, you know, um, uh, belonging or, you know, um, what do you call it? Uh, certainty. Certainty is all about security and all that kind of stuff, the fundamentals, having certainty and security. The second stage is uncertainty, wanting then to grow a bit bigger and get have a bit of adventure. The third level where you're, you're expanding and growing into your true spirituality is love, needing love and connection. The fourth level, when you feel you've got that, those, so you're building, the layers that you're building. The fourth level is significance, where the ego comes in. Um, you need, you've done all this and you want to, to be doing something to give you significance. And then after that, at levels five and six is where the real expansion comes. You go into the level of growth, where you're learning, you're wanting to understand, you go into this where you're, you're content, you know who you are, you're comfortable with who you are, you go into a, grow, a level of growth and opening your eyes to the world, to people, listening, patience comes in. And the final level is contribution. That's when, you know, you're a guru, you're, you know, Dalai Lama and you're, you're in a place where you're giving. It's not about you. It's you're in a place of well, how do I give back, how do I contribute, how do I bring peace, patience and that into humanity. Um, and every human being goes through those phases and people are at different phases in this life. You know, if you believe in reincarnation, you know, every life yeah. you come into, you're trying to grow to that other level, you know. So I don't know how we got into that topic. Anyway. That's all right. <laughs> but, you know, in that, in the, yeah. Yeah, for, you know, organisation and this group that we're trying to, body that we're trying to create, you need to have so much patience because you have to come from a place of understanding because these people are all really trying to do good. They really are. So you have to validate them. And and, and if you validate them, you do everything and they're still ego-driven, then you know that they're not part of this group. And you say, Allah, ikun ma'ak, ma'akun, berikun, bas nihna. We're, we're walking this way, you know, and yeah. this is our values and we all have to abide by them and, and we all are made accountable to those values. And this is, and that's when you set really strong foundations and values. It makes it really easy to make decisions and see who is really part of you and who isn't. Yeah. And there's no need for anger or violence or swearing or anything. It's just, hey, it's not working. And I learned that so profoundly when I was doing. Tony Robbins, you know Tony Robbins? Yeah. America, I love him to death. Like I grew so much. Just his, um, it just, I, it, it made so much sense, you know, when I'm trying to grow my business and frustrated with stuff and not doing this and the, you know, and he was so peaceful about it. It's like, you know, like it's a value chain, a business, just like a country, just like a home. And everyone's got a role to play in that value chain. And when you sit down with that person, you say, you know, you should describe the value chain and, you know, we've, you're, you know, we've got, you know, 10 people here, Max and Joe and Blob and Mary and whatever, um, and you're you're sitting here and and when you don't do your work, you know, it blocks the chain. We can't work. Everyone gets affected. And so, you know, do you think you can do your job? You know, like what's hell holding you up? How do we help you? Whatever. And if you go through that process and, it doesn't work. It's like, hey, you know, maybe this just isn't for you, you know, and yeah. that's okay. And maybe you need to go play with some other people because we need to do this here. And you let them go. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you about corruption? Um, you know, part of the frustration. Light up another cigarette right now. Yeah, yeah please do. <laughs> um, so part of the frustration um, with with folks who want to invest in Lebanon mm. is that 
there's this image, um, justly or unjustly, that no matter how much sand you put in somebody's hand, it just leaks, mm. right? Everything just leaks. And to the point where it's, uh, there's a common recurring joke on the internet that even criticize not even the government that criticize the nonprofit sector in 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 Lebanon the the people who are trying to advertise themselves and position themselves as being an independent sector fixing fixing the the endemic systemic pro- problems that face ordinary individuals without fail every single organization that gets some huge grant or some huge investment from abroad, never from uh, locally, um, always gets criticized justly or unjustly that there's corruption mm. and that the people who are the, the constituencies that are intended to, to benefit from these investments are only getting a small share and the lion's share are going to folks at the top through kickbacks or through um, things like that. And you know, through your reporting and your work and your research and your efforts, do you have any good ideas on how to either fix the image or fix the truth? Look, you know, all of it's true, and then, but it it doesn't apply to everyone because there are a lot of very good NGOs in Lebanon. But you know, the fact is that there are more NGOs in Lebanon than you know GDP per capita than any other country in the world, which really is a problem and really where all this questioning comes in and doubt and um and there are there is a hell of a lot of corruption and a lot of um waste of money and people yeah siphoning off funds that should have gone to the needy but again i say having lived in australia in america in the, the, the uk it's everywhere there are charities everywhere there are they're not only in Australia, in Lebanon, where, you know, you've got these things going and they, in Australia, and I'm sure in other countries, they have to declare how much money actually goes to the beneficiaries. And you see in some charities, you know, 70% goes to admin, 30% goes to the, the needy and, you know, and they get away with it because they're being transparent. They're allowed to keep going. You know, the people sending the money should be questioning and looking into where who they're giving their money to, the people who are donating so I ask people to be more um, curious and um, do you, do your due diligence. I mean, I, I donate to a lot of charities um, and they're very specific around the world and in Lebanon, but I've done my due diligence. You know, I, I yeah. make sure the majority goes to the people that need it. Um, you know, you can't, you, again, it's, it, it's the same thing as we were talking about earlier. Um, we don't have a country or a government or a institutions that investigate or interrogate corruption in Lebanon. They don't want them. In Australia, we have the Anti-Corruption Commission. In America, you've got multiple investigations and, you know, institutions, and they still get away with it, but it's really minimal compared to the, the level in Lebanon. Uh, they've destroyed those institutions intentionally and they've rewritten legislation here to allow them to be owners of banks. You know, this, you know, conflict of interest is rife throughout the country and they've set up their own NGOs and they've put people in the front men in the front to, you know, um, yeah. find money and get money and, and, and all this stuff. So it's a reality, but, you know, uh, but there are good charities here that are doing outstanding work and people should just do their proper due diligence to find out if they want to serve and help Lebanon or find families or find people directly to help, you know. And, yeah. oh, my God, there's so many ways that we could set things up. And uh, I just I got a lot of people saying, you know, we want to, from outside who want to help Lebanon and I just don't have enough time and hours in the day to be able to help facilitate and work with them on it. There's tremendous ideas, but, you know, I am setting up my own foundation here and it's not to do handouts, but it's been stalled a little bit because I've got so much on, but it's, and I've been working, I've been, I I didn't do it just for the sake of it. I'm not doing it for the sake of it. And it was um, after like investigating a lot of what charities do here 
And I said, you know, we've got to shift away from handouts and keeping people with their head bowed and dependent. And how do we do that? 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 How do we, how do we give them independence? How do we give them self-sustaining, you know, lives? How do we empower them? And after, you know, quite a few months and traveling and talking and thinking about it, I remembered this story from when I was a journalist in, you know, the eighties and nineties, um, uh, it's some big institutions around the world wanted to help people in Africa and India and the poverty, the extreme poverty, the people, the most needy. And I remember this program, it was a microfinancing loan that they started. And the story of this woman who is a dressmaker in this very impoverished village in the middle of nowhere in India. And she had a skill. She was a dressmaker, but she didn't have a sewing machine. She didn't have material. She didn't have cotton. She didn't have anything, but she could and so they gave her a $3,000 loan over three years. And that woman ended up, you know, uh, over three years eventually employing her family, her extended family, her village and the community. And like three years later, she'd empowered and she was empowered and they were, you know, repaid her loan and she got it back on her feet. And I thought that's the way we've got to do it. We've got to give them back the opportunity to to be self-sustaining and and not be desperate for that bribe when the election comes because they yeah. need money to eat. And so this is the, you know, the idea and we, we're working on it. We're, you know, trying to get there, but I just got to get a few things done. But I think, sure. um, you know, raise money from abroad and directly aim it to, and there's a lot of, we, we've expanded the concept to be far more transparent, to comply with universal standards, to give people visibility, ongoing visibility, engagement, because that's what I do. Like I, when charities I uh, support, I get that visibility, I get the stories, I get the feedback, I get the accountability and I'm, and it gives me confidence to continue to support them. And that's what we need, you know, especially from people, if they're donating from abroad, they're used to that system. They want that yeah. system. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Before we get to the quick Q and a, um, I'm remiss. Uh, I'd be remiss not to ask you, how can people see your film enough Lebanon's uh, darkest hour? Um, okay, so at the moment it's up on Shahid Premium in Arabic. Mm. So the Arabic version is available to anyone who has that subscription. Yeah. Um, it is, um, I think, available on Apple iTunes and I think maybe Amazon. One of my other distributors has put it up there. Um, we're in the so that there. It's not broadly they they are talking about it now that they want to put it up on all streaming platforms and one of the distributors in the US wants to do that um so that might go ahead but um so it'll be coming soon it's just we haven't sort of pushed it out really because i'm also in the process of updating it so there's going to be a new version of it because i want to incorporate the results of the election and yeah. the impact and i think it's really important ending now because we've had the election for the diaspora and um, audiences around the world to see what happened because the film was all leading up to vote, vote, vote. Um, so what happened? Like yeah. big reveal. And there's a lot of good news to be telling in that, you know, when you look at the stats alone, it's fantastic. So, and it really is, um, uh, you know, important to um, close off the story because we, are leading into the next election in 2026. Yeah. So can the can the new version be called now it's really enough. <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> enough is enough. <laughs> um okay, let's do the quick <laughs> <Q> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um all right, let's do this rapid fire QA and then we will wrap up. Um okay. so what are you reading or watching these days? Okay. Oh my God. So much. Um, a lot of it's to do with Lebanon content because I just need to be immersed in what's going on to be able to, um, you know, find the story that's really going to impact people and um, keep talking about Lebanon. <laughs> uh, but I, I haven't, you know, I've got books that I read and I, I um, you know, I, I brought some over. Actually, they're being shipped over from Australia. I've got a whole library. I love to read books. I, I watch 
a lot of um series uh you know sure. i watched um the the um designated survivor it's about america and the um you know the washington the white house um president i i like those sort of shows um because they give you more insight into the world and how international politics and um works um i love goofy shows i watched al haba the whole series and nice. i absolutely loved it i loved learning more deeply about the culture i lo- i i actually you know i love jabal sheikh jabal if he's watching listening <laughs> I just, the character the values that he represented was that is to me is lebanon that's you know that's my people that's yeah. who we are um cool. i watch a lot of stuff you know ted lasso that kind um, of stuff <laughs> nice okay great <laughs> um who would you love to shadow for a day past or present wow um i had this dream and one of my dreams was to shadow steven spielberg uh cuz i just think he's an extraordinary storyteller and filmmaker and the diversity of stories he's brought to the world has really shaped us um but i you know he's one and um I would have died almost to have shadowed Nelson Mandela. Uh to me, you know, what an incredible character. We, you know, the, yeah. you talk about the level of evolution that man evolved in his own lifetime and I would have loved to sit with him for a day and he's such an incredible source of wisdom and um power and you know i i i learned a lot from him reading his story following his stories is everything yeah yeah talk about a talk about a moral arc uh-huh see and he see? Can, see, he's 27 years in solitary confinement yeah. on roby island never gave up and he chipped away at it until he got the chance to sit with de clerk and he convinced him took him 2 years to convince the president of South Africa to abandon apartheid. I mean, how more peaceful a way to transition than yeah. that? Yeah. What do you think people most misunderstand about your work? Ooh. Uh okay. That it's about me. They think it's about me. They think I'm doing it to become famous and whatever and Um you know there's the the people who think I'm in an ego I'm on an ego trip and I'm so not I'm and I you know I just no one else is doing it and I've got a lot of skill and experience and and I know what you know people want to watch video they'd rather watch than read you know I could write articles but people consume video so you've got to be out there reporting it and telling it in a way that they will consume it so um and I absolutely believe in this country so much and the people and um i've spent an absolute fortune i've burning away my kids inheritance i'm paying for all of this to be here and have people here and uh and i could be sitting on a greek island you know writing my next novel or movie <laughs> it's not easy you should re you should reassess your priorities <laughs> i will give you the free therapy <laughs> Uh, no i mean i level up my life really when i'm at, at that place of growth and contribution where there is nothing more that i would want to be doing it's not i have great peace i'm not conflicted about the decision i am a great peace and if i died tomorrow i would be at peace with my decision because yeah. i you know i'm doing what god's asked me to do yeah amazing and then the last question is outside of your field So unrelated to Lebanon, unrelated to the stuff that we talked about. Mm. Who do you admire? Like who gives you inspiration? Oh my god, so many people. Um you know, like look at Greta Thunberg, you know, this young teenager who decided to speak up um for the environment and uh, and she's been trolled and whatever and trashed and you know, she's defiant because she has clear conviction of what she's doing um i you know I, i'm going to i'm going to fail to give you names right now but i'm inspired by so many people and um you know even 
last year at the 100 Successful Women in Business Conference, and you know, we're in London. I met extraordinary women from around the world who they're not famous, famous, but they're doing amazing things for their communities and their countries and in their own way. You know, I find inspiration, you know, in the people here in, in Lebanon, the the courage that they continue to demonstrate and believe and to go on and maintain their humility and, and kindness. Um, I've got friends who inspire me. My, you know, my mother was my greatest inspiration, God rest her soul. And my dad, who's still alive, he taught us discipline and and he had this real conviction of keep, you know, he had this philosophical mind. Mum was a real doer. She came from a very good well-to-do family. He came from abject poverty, <laughs> um, two worlds. And uh, But they all, they brought great characteristics into us as children and taught us real values. And uh, yeah, and yeah. Amazing. Mm. Um, well, Daisy, listen, this has been so much fun talking to you. If anyone's interested in finding your stuff online and they're listening to this podcast, you can find Daisy on social media at D-A-I-Z-Y. G E D E O N um, on everything. And Daisy, thank you so much. This was fun. I had a ball. Thank you. It was really an exploration for me, too. I loved it. Thank you, Mikey. Thanks so much. <laughs>